Welcome to our Composecast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I see myself showing up as yellow here, but uh, I'm actually over a wire today, so I don't know what's going on. I, f- I hope I'm coming in okay. I hope I'm coming in okay on the stream. There we go. It looks like it went back to green, but... I'm doing all right over here. How are you doing? Doing doing just fine. I was I was thinking during that intro, how, if we would put the music, if we got music to an intro, if we would do that live or if we would say that for post-production. I don't know. I'm still thinking about it. Ah, that'd be an interesting play. I, I'd love to see it. I, see, would you play it through Jitsi? Over Jitsi? I, or I don't know. I don't, I honestly don't know. Would it be know. live? Is it something that, you know, crack out a guitar, play some drums or something? <laughs> play it live? <laughs> I don't know. I was thinking post probably post anyway so what's this thing about you uh going over the wire you you finally made the the dive or how did that I, end up? you could say that i uh took what was already there kind of made it my own and uh <laughs> i'm running running over coax so ethernet over coax so this is kind of crazy i don't know how much i talked about it last week there was a so there's a coax cable um last episode i was talking about that runs from the basement where i have a switch to my uh, room now i wanted to run like a 90 foot ethernet cable or you know some kind of long ethernet cable all the way from my room down around back to the switch through the basement it looked like all the holes were there and everything but it's gonna sound kind of lame i didn't have a drill i didn't have any equipment to you know crimp the ethernet or rj45 so i ended up going over coax the cable company is probably going to kill me but they're never going to find out i <laughs> cut their cable right at, right where i needed it in the basement uh, made sure it was mine, of course, before I just, you know, cut it. Uh, I crimped that cable with like a coax um, crimper. And then there's this like Hitron or whatever. On Amazon, you can purchase these uh, converters and it's a multimedia over coax is basically what it does. And you just, it's a power device and you plug the power device into the wall. You put in a coax on one side, you put in ethernet on the other. And essentially it's a wire, right? So you're sending bits over this bits over bits over a cable at, at the end of the day. So, so far it's been working great. It's fast. It's awesome. I put in a little like eight port unmanaged switch at the, uh, at the base of my room here. So everything in my room can have a cable if it wants it, if it needs it, uh, TV, I think I have like two laptops. Um, so everything's going well over here and everything's a lot faster too. So I hope I'm coming in. All right. That's awesome. It's it's also a little bit of a slippery slope. That's actually how my first home lab started. I had a switch and two computers, and I was like, oh, what can I do with this? Here we go. <laughs> exactly. So Excited to see where you go from here, yeah. Yeah, and you know what? You're the one that put the bug in my ear for that. You said, oh, yeah, you know, you can get i uh, – I'm sure there's some kind of coax converter, and that was right before last episode. So here we are, the slippery <laughs> slope. But – Everything good over there? Any new improvements on your uh, lab? I know you, I I think last episode you had the bookshelf, but I do love seeing it. Y- yeah, I mean it looks it looks great. No, no, nothing nothing improvement here. But uh, speaking of slippery slopes, uh, t- uh, talking about Microsoft's uh, yeah embrace extend extinguish paradigm, right? I think someone flipped the extinguish trigger a bit too quick. Uh, here, if if uh, you take a look at the first news item that we have, where Microsoft uh, shut down their repositories for almost an, an entire day. So uh, on June sixteenth, um, everything on packages.microsoft.com, um, from Visual Studio Code to Microsoft Edge and Team packages, um, were unavailable for that in entire. 20 hours um, now it's funny and and i bring this up not to more so disparage microsoft but to set the stage for what we're going to talk about in our grab bag today because i did want to go over code editors and one of the things that you and i have been talking about is standardizing on visual studio code and lo and behold that was the day that i went to go and try the install and i was like what is going on with this and obviously this came out. I'm like, well, that's a sign. And yeah. 
and decided to dive into what we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, later today. And uh, as as part of what I found that I I know I'm not gonna get to talk about in the editor discussion, so I did want to put it here as part of that intro was stuff that I could do with FCF because one of the things that I've been finding out more and more, and I I don't know if you're the same way, but man, it is it is too easy for me to just search something rather than to navigate a hierarchy or anything else to, to remember something. Oh, totally. Sure. And and I would rather just start searching, you know, fuzzy searching stuff and, and, and figuring that out. Like even in my in my browser, right? I have a Vivaldi has a control space shortcut that I use yeah. extensively. Right. Uh, I, I use that from switching tabs to opening new windows to opening sessions to saving bookmarks. I mean, it's there's just a lot of things that it can do. And it, it they're actually continuing to add on right now. It can also open plug in add on menus. So like uh, my Bitwarden plug in, I can open that menu with this control space. space or control yeah. space. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's just become very, very easy. So I'm I'm thinking, well. Searching is a way to go, right? And and I don't know what you know VS Code or, or whatever has implemented for this, but uh, I have heard a lot of of FCF, which is a simple fuzzy finder. Uh, but the way it it can be implemented is really really cool when you when you see how it gets implemented in in stuff like. Uh, history auto completing right or or different auto completing or um i saw one where you could look through uh well well this one i mean you're, you're just fuzzily changing directories i mean the first trick using fcf to cd into a directory right and you're piping stuff into into fcf which allows you to both type and navigate at the same time and it, it just it just blew my mind when I started looking into all the things that I could search through. Like if I have a list of commands or if I have a uh, list of, of files or if I, I, you know, if if this replaces fine for me, I, honestly, really, there's there's no reason for me at all anymore to use fine when I can use this to do anything. But you can also pipe, you know, uh, like get to it, like different get commands and, and, and find different places that that things happened or you know history um, one of the cool things too that it can do uh, that I especially found on, on one of uh, my vim excursions was being able to preview a file as you're going through the the autocomplete it'll actually pop up a preview on the side so I'm interested to, to look into this to see you know I- exactly what you can do because you can you can fuzzily search through anything so this is this is that fuzzy front end that you needed for all of the back end unix programs that we know and love uh, so i'm i'm looking at how i want to implement this um in my day-to-day i know i also maintain my own zshrc file which is yeah to be fair building off a lot of the oh my zsh functions sure right but i'm i'm looking at this and saying all right what can I be doing with this and, and what can I implement? And, and I'm, I'm trying to, trying to expand. And, and, and this was just, this was like, Oh, this is actually possible now. Like now I have to start thinking about the, the things I could implement this on. So I, I, I just wanted to kind of share that for anyone who has like not looked into it because it's something new and it's not, you know, in the old Unix books, definitely pick it up and give it a go because it is, a very very useful program it it provides a a very good use to it i also have a another link um about uh to adjust about how it can uh display a, a hierarchy preview of the directory that you're looking at i was like that's just, that's just really cool like the things people are able to do with it i was like why well, that's crazy crazy cool yeah, and you're totally right too about everyone anymore. It's so much easier to default to searching than it is to look. And I do this all the time. I have like a personal blog with just documentation stuff I want to refer back to, or if I need to refer back to it, I don't go looking for the po- 
I honestly don't go looking through the post. I yeah, I immediately search like keywords or words that or phrases that I think are going to be in that post that I was, you know, have on my mind or what I'm thinking about. And I immediately try and jump to those. And that was why I was so excited that Canboard has that plugin, that extensible search or whatever that you found. Yeah. Where you can search through all the comments and metadata and stuff like that instead of simply the title or the the, t- the titles in the description basically or the title and the id yeah so that's that's super handy because i know people will default to search because it's the way people think and and uh, I'm, I'm actually still searching for a note-taking solution like i know notions out there obsidians caught my eye uh, the thing i would really like to do is like mind mapping honestly as far as like note-taking over a long period of time but yeah for instance like uh going to going to church and, and taking notes on the sermon on Sunday, right? So I'm taking notes on those in a Kanban, Kanboard task, right? Okay. And then yeah. I'm kicking that Kanboard task two days because we got a Tuesday group night to, to go over it. Sure. Right. But then I don't refer to that note at all. I was going to say, the one thing that you, it's hard to do, it, a Kanboard is n- not a knowledge base, Right. It's they're different things, and that's the one thing. That's kind of the one gap I've also seen is the board. It once it hits done, unfortunately, this is kind of how it rolls. Sometimes it's hey, it's done. You know, it's done. You can go back and look stuff up for long term for reoccurring for reoccurring. It's almost like take a task that's been there and done, move it back to like an in progress review or something, and then you know force yourself to review it and then close it again. And then pick a random one on another day. Yeah. But I know exactly what you're saying. Once the task is done, it just, this is how I see the same thing. It just closes and then out of there. But which is, which is fine because really those notes are just re- referring, you know, my own self back to the discussion that I want to, or discussion points that I want to bring up in, in that, you know, or, or in our meetings, right. I, I note something I want to bring up. I, I can put that in the comment section and then we bring it right. up during the meeting. Right. right. And that, that is a great uh, way to, to reference that as well. Um, but yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Camboard is not a knowledge base. And once it hits done, it's, it's, it's done. Do you have a knowledge base at work that you kind of um, use or maintain? We do. We do. We have, we have confluence. Um, and basically okay. it's, it's, it's gotten real messy. Like that's totally. And that's just how the nature of it just kind of tends towards chaos. It, I mean, and I don't know if there is a way where it doesn't tend towards chaos. I don't know if there's a way where you can say, Hey, maintenance, right? <sighs> you take, it sucks to say, but you have to sit down and look at it. You have to sit, you have to, that's how I look at it. You have to put time away to say, Hey, look, you know, at the end of every quarter, end of every year under every half year we're going to walk through everything and we're going to just get rid of anything that's not needed and well it's easy to say hard to do because how do you know what's how do you know what you need how do you know what you don't that's just kind of how i do it with my own my own stuff and then you know i don't delete anything that's old i just kind of move it towards it's called like archive yeah just yeah you can archive stuff yeah and having having the capability to search really alleviates the necessity to keep it super organized totally because you can just search so as long as the content is there now yeah the only question you have to ask yourself is is it up to date right if it's like old or if it's incorrect then you have a problem right you don't necessarily have to categorize it sure but it could be incorrect which is itself a problem and that's where you're you're upkeep and maintenance comes into play and then you have to say all right are we doing what i mean what what uh, what are we doing right where where is either the business justification right but the business need for it or right. where is the pain point and chances are knowledge bases if they're internal aren't going to be a a business need external maybe they might not be a pain point either i mean onboarding and bringing on New users, new team members. Yeah, that's kind of where I've landed too. So anyways, we've already talked about how upkeep documentation is hard. But I mean, like like I said, when whenever I can find a solution that involves me searching or, you know Totally being able to to find stuff based on whatever's in my head at the time, 
I'm okay with that, right? I don't want an elaborate, complex system of hierarchical nothing. I, I don't need another thing to remember like that. That's arbitrary anyways. Right. So I can get rid of that if I can just keep in my head what I need to and search it as it it p- springs to my mind. I would be much happier with that kind of solution. On an as-needed basis. That's kind of how – so I, we have full Microsoft Suite. So I actually use OneNote to – maintain a lot of my personal stuff at work and it ends up being exactly that it's a flat file structure where you know i got one tab for all like documentation one tab for you know current tickets i'm working on and stuff i'm working on but really at the end of the day it's just control f (laughs) go from there (laughs) yeah do you want to jump in uh, news community items here i had a couple things that i saw i wanted to point out now yeah, you uh, you actually took over looking these up. So yeah, what what did you find? I had, this? I had four out here. Um, I I'll tell you what, I didn't know the uh, structure uh, that we wanted to go with this, so I just kind of pointed out and picked out all the up all the updates. Just to these, just kind of note that these projects are active. So Vault Wharton got another update. Um, jumped to one dot twenty two. Uh, I think dot zero. The there wasn't anything too noticeable with the release uh, besides the fact that. Hey, switch from Bitwarden RS images to the Vault Warden image. And then there's an issue tagged with that. Uh, along with that, it looks like they're really starting to work on that send functionality, which I have not, I haven't checked it out or looked at it yet. I, I think I'm go- going to have to here shortly. And then they did clean up some of the stuff for self hosting. Uh, I think the other one that I saw on there was you don't have to sign or you don't have to check a box saying you accept the terms and conditions if you're self-hosting. So kind of an odd one, but an update nonetheless, right? But other than that, for Bitwarden, it's going to take it's a while. It's going to be a for while. Vault Warden, for Vault it's Warden. It's going to be a while. Uh, I did not see anything else. Uh, the next one was Camboard. Uh, again, I did not see... It was a lot of minor tasks with this. Um, a lot of kind of bug fixes and... I don't know, I just call it general maintenance tasks that were kind of closed out with it. Uh, nothing really caught my eye with a Canboard release here. The project's just chugging along, which is awesome to hear. And then this one I did want to bring up, uh, Firefly 3, they had just a vulnerability fix. So moving forward, <laughs> uh, the last one here, I there was actually something of note here with NextCloud. I feel like they're always just chugging along, right? Um, and this one was their iOS app got a ton of updates. It looked like a lot of it started to become actually embedded within, I guess, the iOS settings. And then the other thing of note was the bulk, I think it was bulk upload or bulk download. They called it chunking for pulling down larger files. So rather than just pulling it down all at once, it looked like you were able to manage the chunk size from zero, which is disabled to 100 megabytes for the transfer. So they're just making transfers more efficient. Right. Which, great to see. Yep. Love to see that. I mean, that's how it speeds up the application, honestly. Um, they also have statuses there, and you're able to do a little bit more with how you save uh, files and photos. So I don't like statuses. It reminds me really? of Skype and... Yeah. AOL and yeah. I don't know. I, I, I honestly, I think I'm moving more and more away from chat as an as a way to categorize communication. Like I would, I would rather not chat. Like I'd rather send messages. So okay, 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 fine, sure. And and that's that's born out of a couple reasons. Yeah, you know, I think in no small part because I can't archive chat. Right, chat is a continuous like you pick up from where you last left off. One, I hate seeing what I sent, you know, the day before, or two days before, because it's it's just not relevant to what I want to talk about right now. Right, um, which is kind of where I guess threading might come in handy uh, on a chat. Uh, but but then also I use like my emails and and forms and stuff like that. All my notifications get archived, right? All all my new pieces of data, because I, I view email as data ingest, honestly, because yeah. it's a it's a piece of information that's coming in, much like a chat message, that I'm gonna have to do something with, either reply to or uh, take action on or whatever. Which means it goes into my process, right? And my process mainly right now is centered around my Canboard board. So what I do is 
is I take the contents of that email, act on them appropriately, you know, under two minutes, I'll just do the thing. Otherwise it goes in the board somewhere. And then I archive the email, you know, regardless or not, if I still have to work on it, right. My, my email gets archived so that there is no more data ingest. It's not sitting in ingest. It's been ingested and processed. It's now in the process of getting processed, right? So I, I don't need it sitting in the inbox there anymore. Whereas chat, it's just a continuous history of everything that's always happened ever. And I'm like, this, this is not helpful for me because now I'm staring at everything, right? And I can't right. filter out what's already been completed. So I I don't know. I am I might just not be a fan of chat. Fair enough. Yeah. And plus, you know, there's a there's an expectation with email. You know, there's the, the expectation that, hey, I'm probably going to get back to this within, you know, a, a, a certain amount of time, whether that's several hours or a day or several days, right? Whereas Chad is expected to be a little bit more instantaneous. That, if yeah. you're available, right, you're expected to reply instantaneously, a.k.a. someone walked over to my desk, not a.k.a., but like, you know, as if someone walked over to my desk. D- no, don't. Don't do that. <laughs> send send me a message. It is not you are not that important to come over and you know, no offense. You're right. not that important to to come over and interrupt whatever I'm doing. And totally. and if you are, then I'll send you an email, say, Hey, can you give me a call? Hey, right. No, hey, can you email me? If it's that important, email me. Yeah. Don't tell well, me. Or, in person. Or, or yeah. I mean, or call me because at that point I can say, Hey, I don't have time for a chat right now. Let's schedule something, right? Sure. Because, you know, some, some things are better to chat. Like I'm, and, and by chat, I mean talk about, right? And, and whether it's a voice call or whether it's a video call or whether that's actually meeting, meeting the person up. And I'm not, I'm not going to argue that. I mean, that's, that's certainly a thing, but I am not, I don't have office hours, right? I'm not just sitting there twiddling my thumbs doing, right. you know, busy work. I'm, right. I've got stuff to do, stuff I probably shouldn't be interrupted while doing. Like when I was trying to figure out how to get that CRM working, right? I was layers deep into figuring out, you know, this, how CSP works and the different arguments you can use and what, you know, unsafe inline actually allows and doesn't allow and, you know, the the attack vectors. So I was, you know, I'm, I'm deep into trying to figure that out. The last thing I need to do is Bob to come up and go, hey, did you, uh, you submit your TPS report? Right, right. You're in the middle of something. Uh, I'm in the middle of something. You just took you right out of it, too. Anyways, that's my rant. My rant is over. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Nothing more. I don't have anything else to add with the uh, next cloud development here. Now, I'm, I'll am i tell you what. I think the project is just gung-ho. I mean, they just do not stop. And uh, their blog and the news they have, it does, it, it does not end. It's a constant stream of content of developments it's so yeah kudos to uh next cloud um and then with that i'll jump into our our compose development here sure uh so we have right now i'm just going to mention the one version of it because we don't have the public version available we do have the concierge form for an easy onboarding experience concierge sign up but we're really excited for it. it's i'm really excited for it, honestly um what we had before uh was a react form with multiple levels i'd say layers of input um and it was the form was the form was pretty big and it was just uh like a sheet of papers like hey fill out page one flip fill out page two flip pull out you know three four and i think there were seven sheets basically i would call seven different forms seven different separate forms you had to go through to sign up and I think from the get-go, I never really wanted that. It was just kind of something that was easier to develop as kind of, I would say, constraints and as requirements came about. It was like, oh, let's just add another form, make it a, a JavaScript request, send it off. It's like, oh, wait, we also need, you know, we need an email. Okay, fine. That's layer one. We need a domain. Okay, well, that can be form two right there. All right, right, perfect. Oh, we need to collect credit card information. Oh, okay, perfect. We need services. What services do they want to sign up? All right, add that as a form. What payment plan or what, you know, what kind of instance do they want? Add another form, you know. All right, they finally want to deploy, hit deploy. So it was seven different forms, essentially. Seven different forms, seven different fields you had to fill out on a separate basis to finally hit deploy. So this is right in front of you. Now that we have everything we need, (laughs) now that we have, you know, name, domain, plan, 
email, what type of instance you want, and the services. Basically, it's all on one page, which makes it easy to <laughs> deploy and easy for us to either, you know, it's easy. It makes it easy to deploy, end of the day. So I'm really excited for it. Uh, right now, it's only on our end, on the admin end. So if you sign up with one of us, it's something that we can do. Now, I do. we are going to work towards, or I am going to work towards, um, getting making that public facing. So we're going to work towards that uh, coming up here, which we're getting close to. But nothing else to add with that one. Um, I don't know if you had any any notes or anything you wanted to add with it. Well, just coming back to why we did this, I mean, we both of us, I think, were impressed by DigitalOcean and how easy they make the totally. deployment process. And we're like, we want to emulate that. We, you know, we not not just the actual like design and stuff that the the feeling and and the the sense that we got as we walked through that the 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 clarity and just the ease of mind really that came along with that. We're like, well, this is fairly professional and polished and you know straightforward and. I think we were we were shooting at that, and after taking a look at it, we're like, "That's good. Let's do V two, which even gets closer." Yeah. yeah, I'm excited to get the public one out there. So instead of the uh, sign up now, going to like uh, an email page, just asking for email stuff, we can hit sign up now, and then actually have it linked to that page. But yeah, nothing else. I mean, we're chugging right along here. I'm gonna jump right into our integration this week, which is not Bitwarden. It's Vault Warden. And so today we're going to go into the application interface. If you have not seen it, we do have an introduction episode out, or I don't know what we called it, an overview episode already out yeah. there. Um, so today we're just going to dive into kind of the application interface. And truthfully, it's really over a, hand feel, a handful of items and uh, filters really on that, that home page, that front screen, just kind of. I want to talk about how I use it and how just kind of what kind of stuff's out there on that interface. Um, so the one thing uh, I broke it down here. So there's vault items and there's filters. Uh, there's also a couple other settings that you can look at and navigate through. I don't have, I, I need to go back through and populate them on the actual show notes, but today I really want to talk about the vault items and filters just because I found them. Very interesting, and I've used them in different ways. Uh, so there are four different types of items that can be created in Vault Warden. It's a login, a card, an identity, and a secure note. Honestly, when I say those, they're probably very self-explanatory. Um, you know, a login would be like a login for a website. A card would be like for a credit card or debit card. Uh, identity is for an identity, like a personal identity, which kind of an interesting one if you ask me if you're holding multiple identities maybe you want to uh, separate those use those in that way and then secure note which is kind of my personal favorite after login which is just uh you know give this thing a title and dump in some text and you're off <laughs> so it's very plain um in the sense that it's just a name in a box essentially when you create an item it's could be one of the easiest user interfaces. I think that's why I love this application so much. If you don't have a password manager, it, I, I, I'd question how you get along. Do you rem Is that what you do? Do you remember passwords? Is that your job to remember passwords? Uh, I think in the overview episode, we said there were 273. The average person has 270 passwords or something like that. Logins, at least. Yeah, logins, which... If you have the same password, just think about having to go through and change your password for every single one of those. I can't. But getting back to Vault Warden here, it's very easy. So when you log in, immediately you're dropped. It's like the top right of the page, there's an add item button. And when you add the item, you can select what, you know, what type of item is this. Uh, and then with the login, you get the name of the item, the folder, the username, the password. The You can actually add authenticator keys, TOTP keys. Um, and then you have the option for uh, URI and then match detection, which is pretty, pretty awesome, pretty sweet uh, for, you know, how do you want to match um, subdirectory or do you, how do you want a domain match uh, this entry? Uh, and then along with it, you get notes and you can also add custom fields. Uh, then actually the last one, which is very kind of important as you start to get into organizations and, you know, differentiating your passwords versus shared passwords you get the ownership and i blacked them all out on the 
uh, pictures I put on the uh, book stack instance, but essentially with this, you can choose your personal account, which ends up being uh, for me, like my email. And then for, you can also set it to like an organization. So say Andrew and I have an organization out there, uh, Compositional Enterprises, and I want to say, hey, look, we, you need this password. I need this password. We both want to be able to modify this item, check this item out. Um, basically, we can say, the organization owns this, so we all have access to it. Login is by far the most used node, that, without a doubt. I mean, honestly, I think I probably have 350 entries in my personal books or my personal vault warden, and I would say probably 325, 330 are logins, just of various kinds. Moving forward here, uh, the new, uh, the next one, honestly, which I have never used was card, adding a credit card. So you can add the name, you can add the folder, you can add card holder name, the brand. So that drops down like Visa, MasterCard, American Express, uh, the number on it, expiration date, the year, the CVV. Have you, real quick here, while you're editing everything, have you used the card? Yeah, this is absolutely something I can talk on for sure. Yeah, go for it because I have I I was looking through it today and I had not used I I I, I it's in my own instance, but I'm still ske- uh, kind of skeptical on putting my card information into the website, which is such an odd like I don't know what to call it paradox because I put all my other lo- you know I put my bank login information in there. It's like what why not put the card in there? So yeah, go for it if you want to talk on it. Sure. So. What I use this for mainly is all my virtual account numbers. With my, so I have a, a city double cash card. And one of the benefits of that card is the ability to generate basically dynamic credit card numbers. Those credit card numbers are tracked by city and they all link back to my one account. So they're all branching off my one account. On my statement, uh, I can see if one of these virtual numbers was used for a purchase. And the last the last really cool thing about it is that it restricts one card to one vendor, right? So there's there's those those couple things going on there which which make virtual cards just so useful, That's awesome. right? Yeah. Because you yeah. you were talking about you were talking about think about how many passwords you have out uh, on the right. internet, right? Right. How many times if I put in my credit card somewhere on the, on internet. the internet right to get something right so if if you're not using paypal and and that would be the other alternative right that that kind of does that but that's still going to be your central point of failure what you would do is you take these different credit card numbers and you would put them in different different vendors so for instance i have a recurring subscription to c4 for the energy drink right so i i have a separate credit card for them and every month it gets billed and i see that on my account and it comes through that separate virtual account number Um, similarly i have one with dollar shave club and every month they ping the credit card that's on file and they send me the that month's box so these are these are used uh over a period of time uh, you can you can put time constraints on them. You can put dollar limits on them, or you can just use them as as one offs, right? And in that case, I would get them and I would use it for uh, what what was that? A, a, a where I got the shirt, uh, Poshmark. Yeah. Right? Uh, I, I have never bought anything on there, and I don't really plan on buying anything there after this, right? So. I generated a virtual account number, no time limit, right? And and no dollar limit. I'm like, this is just a one-time use thing. So I put that card number into to Poshmark and it, it connects right back to my regular account. So it shows up on my statement along with all of my other purchases. It says, by the way, you know, it was, it was a virtual account number that was actually ran. Here's a last for that number. Uh, so it, it, it can tell me when that's been used. Now, the benefit of this is if that gets breached for any reason then it's not my credit card that i now have to go change everywhere and they can charge anything to right they have a virtual account number that's virtually useless because it's you know it's it's only for that one time it's only linked to the one vendor and if there's no time specified on it it's only linked i believe to that one transaction right so it's like a 
it's a single use kind of thing. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I didn't even know. Yeah. It's like a password manager for your credit card. It's it's amazing. You know, it'll it'll generate a separate CVV. It'll generate, you know, expiration. Will you add those then to Bit or Vault Warden then? For my reoccurring ones, yes, I do. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, that that's um and then if I was smart, what I could do is I could look at them and see when they were expiring. And I could know about that beforehand and go and renew them, but I don't do that yet because I'm lazy. So that's awesome, though. I didn't, I didn't even think about that. The virtual mm-hmm. cards and putting those in there. I don't use. Unfortunately for me, I I kind of just track everything as it comes in as I purchase it, and then it it all ends up on one card, one statement. But I and haven't I know had any issues. Some thus cards far. do this, and some cards don't. Like uh, Capital One does it. Uh, some Amex cards do it. Uh, there's also privacy.com uh, where they run that same type of service for you where you give them the card number, you tell them how much you want to you know, put on your account, and then you can have multiple cards on on that. And, and so there's several different ways to do that, uh, but that would require that you track cards. So uh, oh, and then right. and then also this is this comes in handy you know if you do lose a card right you have all the information there so you can call and cancel pretty quick now that's not to say that banks aren't pretty willing to work with you without having that card number right if you call and say it's been stolen but it's just a nice to have uh, just in case so uh, but yeah I I wouldn't mind throwing it up there I'm glad you had that anecdote because I I was really searching I was I was thinking to myself oh my what well, you know. For me, at least, oh, I have not added a card into Vault Warden before. I can't imagine yeah. why I would either. I only have you know a handful. Well, and this this may be a good good time to to divert really quickly into you know how Vault Warden actually works, like what what the security posture is, right? And 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 how that how that is. Um, now, I have a. Bitwarden application on my phone, um, on my browser, and then there's obviously the web one. Um, and so there's there's a couple things that you're doing when you store your, your passwords. Yeah, right? and I think you should explain this to everybody just to get into the nitty gritty because I know you have. Yes, I have. I have. So I am I am at least qualified to speak on it. Uh, if If not well spoken on it I, I i can at least i can at least maybe answer some questions uh, but the the way i like to break the way bitwarden uh, as the upstream version as well as vault warden how they how they do their encryption is that everything first of all everything is on client side so that's that's very important to note is that uh, at no point does your actual password go up to the server uh, and in fact, what happens is at no point does any of your login information go up to the server. And that, and that seems very far-fetched, right? Uh, but keep in mind, this is a very closed-circuit application, right? It doesn't need has to expose to an API. It has it doesn't, to be. It doesn't need to work with anything else. It's just you and the server. So realistically, the server is simply an object storage. You could just think of it as like a Dropbox or an xCloud that can that can hold a file for you, right? With a little bit of syntactic sugar sprinkled on top. What it allows for the client side to do is all the sharing and the custom requests and uh, and quicker quicker storage um, than I think you would if, if it was all sort of one blob. Because if it was all sort of one blob, there wouldn't be any advantage to that over like just storing a key pass blob somewhere right the change or the the difference happens is where you start having these these clients that can that can connect to the client or to, excuse me the clients that can connect to the server from different uh, devices from your phone from your browser what have you and then you can use those clients um, that that use the backend server. So the the server does come in handy above and beyond the the simple file storage. But the clients are the things that do all the heavy lifting. Because first of all, they never send not even your your login password up to the server. So when you're actually logging into the server, uh, it's it's simply well. 
So I, I say simply, it's right. in a crypt- cryptographically secure ma- manner requesting the the blob that it expects to be up there, right? Because it takes your username and password, and that's actually more so like the title, the name, if you would, of your blob of encrypted passwords and stuff that it retrieves. So like if I if I try to log into an instance and I can't, it's not that the server said, oh, this user isn't here. It said, I don't have any blob up there that's identified with that. And and I can't say that, oh, did you mean this user or right. it's a wrong password? No. It could be either or both because it doesn't know any of that. It, it isn't just... getting sent any of that, right? So what you would have to do at, at that point uh, is make sure you got your master username and, and password uh, encrypted or well correct and then then you send that up and what bitwarden will do is it will find the data you're looking for and then send it directly back to your device where your device does all the encryption or decryption and then starts to display passwords and users and yada 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 right and it can send that down incrementally as well so it can be a little bit more intelligent about it but in essence there's nothing on your device or well on the server excuse me that would be really accessible the the point of attack that you're looking at is over the network traffic which once again we're encrypted with https and we went over that and and how that works and the advantages and and the disadvantages of that it will not stop you from being scammed right it, it will not stop you from putting in the wrong bit server address uh, but it will protect you if you have the right one to make a secure connection. So the the attack vector at that point is either over the network or on the client, which at that point that's there's a lot more things that you can do. You got a lot. Well, you got a lot bigger problem, right? If it's on your you're hacked on your laptop. All in all, yeah, I don't I don't feel any because I'm I'm doing everything I can to secure my personal devices and and really totally at that point it's like well what are you going to do right i would and and if you look at any security professional's posture on this their posture is it's a lot scarier to have a password breach because they happen a lot more frequently like when's the last time you personally got breached versus when's the last time a major corp- corporation got breached they get breached like every week right, right. So your chances are much, much better that they're going to get popped, and you better hope that the password you used for their stuff is not the password you use for your bank or for other... For 200 other things, right? Yeah. <laughs> Have fun doing that. That's a two days work right there. That's a weekend. Exa- yeah, if if not longer, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I understand the arguments against having a password manager. I just think given the risk-reward scenario... Fully, fully thinking that through leads you to only one conclusion, and that is that it is beneficial to have a password manager. What what we're talking about here is defense in depth, right? And and that's right. something we've we've talked about before. I mean, all right, let's say someone does get your passwords, right? What's the next step? Well, let's start with two factor, right? And uh, two factor is something you've you've talked about bit worn stores too. I mean, is that something you've You've used them there yet? Have you been? I have not. Have you? So I have. Yeah. I wanted to ask you if you have. I have not. I want to switch. I have a lot of phone stuff out there. It's on my phone. I go. What happens when my phone breaks? What happens when it bri- when it breaks? Yeah. It's. I'm done. I need to switch it over. And I saw it's out there. I have not used it yet. I wanted to ask if you. It sounds like you have. Yeah, and it works like any other any other two factor, right? Whether it's on my yeah. phone or whether it's on my browser, right? Right next to my username and password is your your you know your two factor auth code because once you scan that QR code, right? The QR code is an initial state, and then a programmatically determined you know it's incrementation, gonna... right? Uh, right? So so all you got to do is is grab that initial state and then figure out how it's generating the next one. You just keep going from there, and it can continue to calculate it. And so, you know, it it fits into that uh, paradigm quite nicely. That's awesome. I did not realize that was out there because I've been using, you know, whatever Authenticator or whatever app is out there to do those, one, you know, yeah. time-based, one-time passwords uh, for two-factor. And I keep – my phone is just getting older and older, and I'm like, okay, I need, you know, yeah, I got it. I got. I need to put. I need to. 
I need to either back these up or, you know, and I, I always do. I have the secure kit. You can get the recovery yeah. or whatever, but I'm thinking to myself, all right, that's no fun. That's a day wasted right there of going, yeah. you know, and it's only seven or eight services of going through, but it's seven or eight services. That I got to relog in, do like, all right, how do you want to get this? It's like recover. And it's like, all right, what do you want to do now? It's like, all right, change it to the next device or whatever. Rather yeah, than exactly. I didn't, I didn't realize it was out there on Bitwarden that I could do that. Yep. They've already thought about that. It's, it's totally worth it too. So, because yeah, you're right. I mean, your, your single point of failure, you want to push your single point of failure as far away from you as you can. Let's, let's just put it that way. There's always going to be someone that could go catastrophically wrong. You want your single point of failure to be like the annihilation of a continent. You're, you're going to want to push it as far away from you as you can. And this is just another way to do that. Get it off your phone, get it onto a service that multiple devices can access so you don't have to be concerned about one going down, period. I'm definitely going to have to set that up. I also was looking at, uh, I had already made a note on privacy.com. I was looking at that. I looked at that previously. I don't know why I didn't do it before, but definitely going to have to check that one out. So before, the city was running a Flash-based client. Um, but they had to discontinue that since Chrome Yay. ended their support of it. <laughs> so now I can bring it up just regularly, and it's it's a lot easier. Before I was having to do a lot of hacky tricks, and it got it got annoying. But right now it just pops up in a new browser window. It's like here's your new virtual account number. Copy paste, and I'm done. Um. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. Okay. Here's one. Have you used identity? Uh. No. 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 This I, I have not. I, I, me neither. I don't see like a real use for it it the one use case i thought of or could think of was for kids you know maybe you have some kids and you don't want to lose that documentation you know lose that documentation uh for them um along with you know after you add the item you can attach a file to it and you know that's where you just scan the passport scan or not even passport scan the social and scan the birth mm-hmm. certificate and that way you have that information for them but past that i don't I I have not put any information. I have not created an identity before. Hopefully, I never have to. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, there's there's no reason for me, not really. But you do use secure notes. Love love my secure notes. Absolutely. Oh, this is terrible. Um, secure notes I use for Rails keys, which <laughs> it's a file. It it should be a file. We end up what catting the file just getting some gibberish output and i just like all right hey it's out there <laughs> and then we use uh some kind of spit andrew can tell you about the fancy line termination we used it's not a file it's not a line per POSIX, it's not a line is it a file then what is it it's not a file because a file is something that ends in a new line or return character it ends in end of file right and this doesn't it, end no in end it of does file. not it does not even end with end of file it's a it's a null terminator yeah. Oh, the joys of Ruby. Um, anyway, I love my secure notes. I put all kinds of stuff in secure notes just because it doesn't fall under the, any of the other four categories. It doesn't fall under identity. It doesn't fall under login. It doesn't fall under card. So a lot of my stuff, if I have just you know a name for it and I need to upload an attachment with it, it ends up being dumped in as a secure note yeah which you can upload attachments with this too for better or for worse guess what i end up doing if i need it i search it and it's there yeah so. yeah and, and you know back to what we were talking about before i mean you can't search a black book you can absolutely search a password manager i can't tell you how many times i've gone to a site and bitwarn's like oh by the way you have a login for this site i'm like really yeah okay uh, or or going through all my old passwords like do I have a login to this old server? I haven't booted up in three years. It's like, yes, you do. Here it is right here, uh, which kind of gets us right into our next item. I was gonna, I'm going to skip over editing. Editing is editing item is pretty easy. The one time or the couple times I have been burned on editing items is I'll just hit X at the top right instead of save, like some kind of moron, some kind of fool. And after I change my password, sure enough, it's all right, here we go. Hit the reset link and I have to reset it because I, I didn't save the password. I just closed out of editing the uh, element. I'm sure that doesn't happen to normal people, but for me, that does is something I wanted to bring up that you actually have to hit save. And as well, the the right above the save button, you can see that it says updated, the screenshot, uh, when you're editing it. And when you do change your password, it'll save a history of that password for you. 
it's out there. I'll tell you what, I haven't gone through that password history though, or had to go through it. I think I went through once. I I had to go through it once, but it was there. It was available for me. I was like, all right, that's all I needed you to do. Thanks, bro. Which is pretty sweet. There's a lot more. I'm going to quickly go over filters here. I won't dive into organizations. I feel like that's a topic for another day. There's also some other features out there like, um, have I, what is it? Have I been pwned? Uh, database, dictionary attack check. And there are a couple other checks out there. And the tool, there, there are a lot of tools out there. There's, um, you know, updating your information on the actual Bitwarden site at instance itself or sorry vault warden instance itself um but wanted to go over filters here real quick just because that's another one that i use uh quite a bit and that's kind of what drops right when you log in there um filters provide a way to look at different items in your vault based on different categorizations and tag i i call them tags i don't know what they i i should have referred to the doc their official documentation for what it's actually called uh collections i think is what it is but i always have if i'm in uh certain scope i will have a certain set of passwords i i I base mine all in folders which is for better or for worse i know what what we have i don't have a lot of folders but for my home stuff i have almost everything in some kind of folder somewhere or another um the especially big one now has been starting to starting to be aws with iam roles and all that stuff it's like just dumping you know it's like don't put your root as the same as Something that's supposed to log into a server. All right, fine. Um, I have all our, I have a compositional enterprise folder. Um, so everything dumps into it. So everything gets classified for me in a folder. Everything kind of goes into a folder. You know, there's you know banking, and then there's whatever miscellaneous that if something really doesn't fall under a category or a folder, uh, but that just is an easy way for me to logically group all the elements within that certain space. Uh, the thing I really like that we do at Compositional Enterprise here is that we have our vault passwords. Uh, I wanted to bring it up as a note because I think before I didn't have an instance vault password stored under the collection or under an organization. And so it was out there and it's like you go to click the collection. It's like you hit me up. You said, hey, it, you know, this password is not out there. And I'm thinking to myself, well, hang on. Yeah, it is. It's out there for me. It works for me. Uh, but sure enough, it's not in, it's not shared and it's not under the right collection. So, uh, you know, it's a lot, a lot easier to manage these entries categorized. So it is. Yeah. And, and I can kind of go over how I set up some of our collections. Um, so it yeah kind of makes sense. So we have, we have a couple collections here. Um, actually I'm going to pull it up. I had it up because I had to deploy dev, but, um, oh, and one of the funny things is too. So I like have my personal Andrew CZ.com. Yeah. Instance yeah. That I keep the password to log into our compositional enterprises instance uh, in you and me both, you and me both. So, I have the same, same thing running. So I, I go to, I go to the, the CE site and I'm able to log in using my browser autocomplete <laughs> to, to, from, to open from up the my Andrew other. CZ. Yeah, yeah. I always found that funny. Always found that funny. Uh, but for for CE, I I have it. I have a couple different collections. So first, there's the the compositional enterprises one, uh, and that's for everything in compositional enterprises. Yeah. Right. Um, and then we have rcompose.com. And uh, our compose is everything for the our compose instance that we run, uh, specifically for the command center, for Mailgun, for Nextcloud, for for all of those things. API right? keys, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we have the our compose bot, right? Which we just have a generic bot name that we use on all of our different services, whatever wherever we have to use it: GitHub, Docker Hub. Uh, matrix we just call it our compose bot because it's it does what we need it to do so uh, we have all of our logins there categorized under the uh the third collection uh that you can see in the the documentation there and then the last one is vault passwords uh and then vault passwords are the instances which are uh maintained Inter- by us internal yeah our internal which instances. we maintain the vault passwords for um, and that's something I'd like to expand on uh, later too. I'd like to do some cool stuff. We can do some cool like two of three, two of three tricks and, yeah. and, and some cool c- crypto there. But uh, something something that we can do down the road. 
Is there anything else you wanted to add with uh, Vault Warden? I didn't have anything else I need. I wanted to go over, really. I think I'm just going to bring it back around to, to searching, honestly. Like, do it. I, do it. Yeah. I, I know I categorize things in folders, too. I mean, I do the exact same thing if I pull up my personal one, right, and I take a look at my vault. Um, you know, I have my community passwords, which are to all my forums. I have, you know, my home lab, which is all my devices in my home lab, right? Um, I have my services and vendors. So that's, you know, like my Dollar Shave Club, you know, my, my C4 subscription. That's, that's all those logins, right? At the end of the day, what I'm actually doing yep. is I'm either going to that site and using the autofill feature, right? And we can talk about that in everyday usage. Uh, or I'm searching it up looking for the yep. password that I forgot. That's exactly right. That's what I do every time. And so as, as long as you just kind of like barf all the names that you could possibly search for in the title or in the, in the description or whatever, right, you're going to be able to find it again. And that's a beautiful thing about this. Like I'm never going to forget where a password is or I'm not gonna, ever going to misplace it because I know it's going to be in here. It's either in here or it's nowhere. Exactly. The single point. It's the single source of truth. That's what it is. With the distributed points of failure, because that's that's the holy grail right there, I guess. I don't have anything else to add. I would check out the book stack documentation we have out there. I would honestly just check out an instance. Sign up for an instance and check out Bitwarden yourself if you don't have it or if you're not running it. Um, we'd be glad to get you up and running with an instance. So... Um, if you have any questions, absolutely reach out. And I think with that, I'm excited. I'm going to have to go search for, I'm going to have to go search for my Vim configuration to pull it up here. But I think Andrew's going to take us to grab bag, into grab bag with Vim and file editing. Sure. First thing I'm going to do is go over my Vim story, which is my history of Vim. I guess I haven't told really my story about how I really started with with Linux yet, or, or I might have, and I just totally forgot. It was right after high school. Uh, I was going to a community college, uh, and, and the short version is I got a blue screen of death on Windows. Uh, I started playing around with some some Linux distributions, and then I got really wrapped up in configuring it because it was like infinitely configurable, right? I first tried Ubuntu and then hopped over. I believe it was to Crunchbang uh, right after that. And then I just took off from there. I, I did a lot of configuration, right? I, I, I messed around with the Windows Manager, deleted my kernel once upon a time. That's a fun story. The crux of it, though, is that I had to figure out how to navigate a Unix-like computer. Right, as as we all did coming from Windows. And that, of course, meant dealing with the command line. And once I figured out that it, not to be scared of it, right, I thought it was just the coolest thing ever. In fact, there was several moments in my history where I was like, I'm just, just command line applications. I don't want anything else other than command line applications. That quickly went by the wayside. But it was still a fun, you know, month or two. So coming coming to that after a word background, the only text editing that I'd been exposed to was typing up documents in 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 Word. I mean, really, I didn't have some kind of a secret knowledge of, you know, programming or text editors or anything. I was just like, I, I you know, I type stuff up in forums and I type stuff up in Word documents. I couldn't think of another place really and truly that I had a whole lot of exposure. So I didn't really know what the power of a text editor was until I started looking and, and going back to this because a text editor is an editor. It's not a text file creator. Usually, and, and, and this is one of the arguments for Vim, is that Vim is a more powerful modal editor it can it can edit better i'd say than almost any other editor can because of of the way it's it's meant to be used now proponents of emacs would would argue that it's a better editor because it has a better development workflow and i say for a developer when you're writing native code um if you're writing it line by line great good for you right 
But that means you are not using any kind of a, a auto snippet completer or you know any kind of actual editor features. So why not give Vim a try? A- anyways, the, the 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 flame war aside, right? We we all kind of had to step into something. Whether it's Vim, whether it's Emacs, whether it's Nano. If you're one of those guys, I I know some of the guys over at Jupiter Broadcasting are devotees of of Nano. More power to them. It's a it's a losing bet but okay you know whatever floats your boat once you you realize that there is such a thing as is file editing where you can make configuration changes you have to figure out whether you're going to do that in the you know included text editor like if i if i bring up you know text editor in my menu on manjaro right now it is an actual text editor it looks like uh notepad right yeah. which i guess would be the analogous piece of software in a windows machine right of course that is just a very poor representation of what a text editor can do i didn't use that once i figured out the power of the command line i dove at first into vim because i i did weigh the pros and cons of emacs and i i just kind of made my decision there i'm like you know what i emacs is great i just need my my editor so i went in and started editing files uh, VI is is everywhere, so it was already installed, waiting for me to to go. So I just I just jumped in there, right? And I learned how to open files, and I learned how to close files, which there's like five different ways to do that, uh, and none of them are immediately obvious. <laughs> I I learned how to open the help pages, and I started as anyone should start with the Vim Tutor. And if you're not familiar Absolutely. with that, right, I, I think one of the very first things I, I went through, and it's it's this cute little five-minute program that teaches you and runs through the basic you know, ways that you can navigate around a, a text file using uh, keyboard-driven commands and how to use those and, and what a modal text editor is all about. Now, I'm not going to go into, you know, what is Vim and how to do Vim. And this isn't a tutorial, right? This is, this is a conversation that we're having. So... Having having learned how Vim works and how it's modal and you know how you can navigate around in it and and the different um, commands and displays and ways to interact with it, uh, I, I felt like I had a, a good grasp to go ahead and get started with it. And like everyone that got started with it, I used the arrows keys like you know a, a noob, and. That sufficed. I mean, you can scroll up and down in in things and and then, you know, never get any better. Uh, But I I wasn't satisfied with that. The next step of my progress was learning Vim. There was this great article. I can't remember if it was on Stack Overflow or Reddit or some random forum post somewhere. I know I have it saved. Uh, But it says, you don't not understand Vim you don't grok VI, right? And the point of that was to go back and learn what it means to be in a text editor that is just vanilla, no plugins, no add-ons, no special tips or tricks or um, stuff that Vim introduced because Vim is VI improved uh, yeah. rather than simply VI, uh, going back to its its Unix history. So not, he, Yeah, th- not to jump in here but that's how i got started with vim here real quick was that vi's ends up being on it felt like every linux unix system so sure enough i thought you end up with that default i don't even know if emacs was on a lot of those servers i I can't even think of it 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 doesn't come out of the box with it so you're just maybe nano was there as well as the other option but i was ended up ended up with just you know vi you know vi can you know Visual, I don't know if the, what the uh, acronym is, uh, but you end up in a text editor just modifying config files in VI because that's all that's there. Yeah, and, and, and the point of this revolutionary post that I stumbled across, the, the point of that was it's not that Vim is difficult or, or you don't understand it. It's that you don't understand the basic foundation on which it is built. The next logical step then being to figure out the foundation on which it is built, which is mastering VI and and the way that you're supposed to interact uh, with this this piece of software. 
And this was written back in the day when software was a lot more constrained and meant to be interacted with on a more on a, on a stricter basis, right? It wasn't wasn't the user is always right. It's well, this is what we have right now, and then we're going to make it better down the road. So just figure it out right now, and within a lot of different constraints, like not having a mouse, for one. So VI came around under those situations, and Vim evolved out of that. This means, of course, that the best way to learn about Vim was to learn about VI. And there were two videos that I've linked here that spurred me on to understand Vim better. Those were uh, the Vim plus Tmux talk given by OMG Code and Mastering the Vim Language by some Boston meetup. And, well, these two videos, these two videos gave me several key insights. And I'd, I wish I'd gone through and watched them both, but I can still remember off the top of my head. Um, the the Vim plus Tmux one, that, that gave a lot of tips and tricks above and beyond, you know, what is navigating, what is... Um, changing a word, you know, what is, you know, uh, beyond that, you know, how, how should you architect plugins, right? Or how should you use plugins, right? And why would you install a plugin? And um, what are the things that are missing? And what are some cool uh, highlighting tricks that you can do with this, right? And, and what are configurable options and stuff like that? So, so that really gave me a, a broader scope of like what's possible. Mastering the Vim language, though, that was a cool one. That's where I first learned the Vim song. Uh, and, and the Vim song is a song that you sing to yourself as you make different edits in your browser. Right? Um, one of my favorite verses in the Vim song is change in word. Right. So if you have a word, right, um, you can put your cursor somewhere in that word. And then you can change in the word, right? So, so you're actually typing the, the letters C I W, right? And as you're typing these letters, you're singing along to yourself, you know, C I W, change in the word. And that will change inside of that word and it'll delete that word and, and drop you down into an insert mode where you can put the word that you meant to put instead of that word. So you're changing that entire word. Um, Similarly, you can, you know, change all of the things inside the double quotes, right? So you see a double quote, you know, change all the double quotes, you know, and, and you have these noun verb con uh, combinations, right? And, and, and sub subject verb combinations. Uh, and then you, you branch off into more complex sentence structures like uh, change to the second double quote. Right. And, and, and you, you start adding more and more and more and stuff onto it. Right. And you start understanding how working with Vim is a language. Right. And, and you're, you're speaking a language to the computer, but instead of typing the entire word out, right, you're just right. using these letters to symbolically represent what you want your text editor to do. This is different than any other text box where you would be using control characters and, and uh, what Emacs affectionately calls cording, right? Where it looks like you're playing the piano because you you got to do five different combination of key presses to get stuff done. Where Vim is a lot quicker. You're, you're talking to the computer rather than, than playing the computer. So this, that was, that was a, a, a frame shift for me when I started to say, how do I start talking to the computer? Can I learn this Vim song? What are some verses that I can make up, right? So I, I have my default uh, muscle memory verses that I always sing, you know, as I'm going to edit files. Like it's just, it's just my old fallbacks. I, I love to learn new ones. Uh, and it is, you know, it's, it's something you could always keep growing in just like any other art form, right? You can always keep growing in learning more and more combinations of that. So I was I was very happy to to learn those because those gave me the basis of Vim. Those those set the foundation 
for Vim, uh, from which I moved on to plugins and configuration. Um, I don't remember a whole lot of details from this, but I do remember my VimRC going through many different iterations and many different options got added and removed and changed. Totally, and totally. There's, there's still a lot of comments in there from back in the day, you know, commenting out this one option. There's one, you know, I think auto indent and I have a comment there. It's like, well, auto indent has been deprecated in favor of C indent. And then I have C indent as the next line. And so there's a, there's a lot I, I went through and that's just trial and error and learning, you know, reading different configs. And um, what, what really helped me, I think was, imagining what was possible rather than seeing what someone else has implemented right um, now I ran into a barrier doing that and I'll, I'll talk on that in a second here but I think getting off the ground was a lot of I do this a lot and how can I do it quicker or is there a way I can do this inside of him right and and then just looking around and spending the time on the internet looking looking stuff up and saying is there a way I can make this work better um, so going through that, I ran into a lot of plugins. I ran into a lot of configuration settings and just, just trudged through those and kept adding, removing different stuff, playing around with stuff, stuff broke, totally. um, stuff had like, there was, there was just a whole bunch of configurations, right. That, that I tried that couldn't work with each other. Like this is back when I was learning rust. So I did some rust stuff and the rust plugin broke the buffer explorer that I had at the top of the page every time I did a ran a compile and I was just like well crap <laughs> you know what do I do right so d like anything else in computer science I mean just just getting a hands on keyboard and, and running through it and and making those mistakes and, and getting them right the next time so uh, having gone through that uh, I lapsed into this period where I just kind of lived with the paper cuts I became that, you know, and, and this is kind of when I was doing a lot of other stuff and I was like, look, I just need this program to work for me, right? And I was like, I'm just going to do the basics, right? I I feel like I've regressed a lot there because I forgot all my customizations, right? I, I, yeah. I just kind of fell back on, on muscle memory, on the easy things, uh, you know, it, holding down J and K to go up and down instead of using control D control U, you know, page up, and down. up down. Yeah. 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 Um, I'll say that during that time, um, and I don't have this in the show notes, but I think during that time is when I started using, uh, it wasn't Vim Fox. It was, but it was, it was a plugin for Firefox. Neo Vim? Oh, Vimperator. No, okay. The Vimperator. Okay. Yeah. 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 So uh, Vimperator was a plugin for Firefox, which made your browser Vim friendly, right? So you had different key bindings uh, to follow links and to um, go back and forth in pages and go to specific tabs. And um, it was just highly customizable and very low level. And I think that plus all the plugins and configuration that I was trying out was just too much at one time. Like I, I tried to implement too much and I lost it all. Like I, yeah. I literally reverted back to what I'd learned going through vanilla Vim. And I was like, well, I, I know how to do, you know, several different, several different sentences, several different verses. Right. And, and I know how to put those together and I know, you know, the basics of, of search and replace and, and, and various other things. So, so I fell back a lot on that and all my customizations and custom key bindings and stuff like that. Uh, I, I forgot most of them just, just out of sheer disuse. Right. Uh, which, which is kind of a testament to, you know, I can imagine how to set up a whole bunch of cool things. Right. Totally. But it does not matter if I don't remember them. Right. Yeah, come and especially coming from the guy, I mean, you always say incremental change. Never these massive changes. It's always an increment, you know, take the small step but make a lot of them, right? And that's kind of always how I feel like we've been progressing through. It's like, all right, don't sit down and do the 21 task. You know, I'm just referring back to tasks here. Don't do the one that's 21 complexity. Break it down. Break it down from a 13 even. So I, I can't believe, you know, I I can just picture it though. You know, you, you try and implement 
you make your vimrc file you just take you basically cut paste it from someone else's and then you load in every plugin that you find out there that seems cool it's just like you're adding it to firefox just i can picture just in over your head and what to do almost what to do next and where you know where to go with the vim so i kind of interesting to hear you say that you're just kind of struggle you know just going through that yeah which is which is exactly where i was right about the time that uh neo vim came out yeah and and that was several years ago but neo vim came out i didn't jump on that because i was i was kind of still wallowing i was still in that in that rut and recently and i'm talking recently like within the past several weeks I've started to try to pull myself out of that and say, all right, look, you, you've got a good workflow going on here. You've got, you know, little tips and tricks. You have numbers, a lot of you know, information, down, right? You have, you know, you have, you have line numbers pretty well documented. You, you, you're starting to learn a little bit better language mastery. You know, you're, you're branching out in different things. It's time to revisit what you have and let's play around with some of this. So I decided to look in NeoVim and what it could do. Basically it has support for better programming languages. So theoretically there'd be better plugins that could be ran on it. Now turns out that's not really the case. There's not a whole lot of difference nowadays. Uh, there was when NeoVim came out, of course, there was a lot of uh, stuff going on around it and I th still think it's it's pretty cool but the one thing that was the coolest that I found was space vim caught my attention and space vim installs by overwriting your vimrc so which is why you want to back it up first and your dot vim directory oh man I I could just picture that being a bad day because I'll tell you what I sit here I I don't have I know you, are you a big dot file do you upload your dot files in uh, repo and everything I think I have them out there but man I'll tell you I would be so disappointed if hey would you like to install space vim yes hey where did my configurations go <laughs> honestly i backed them up like i moved them out of the way so they weren't even there i figured it would probably warn me if i tried to but i don't really know they're not risk it right exactly so what it does is it it includes a whole bunch of plugins and configuration options by default so this is it's, awesome. it's almost like a distribution of a vim like manjaro is a distribution of linux right and it's it's one catch it's 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 one cool catch is that while it maintains a leader key uh, which is a key that can be used especially when you're setting up your own shortcuts um, you can just do leader whatever key and it's there's a fairly high chance that that key is not used so you can set up your own kind of shortcuts that you would like to use in addition to that leader key it also uses the space key quite extensively uh, and what the space key does is it actually pops up a menu for you that feels a lot like vim so like it'll it'll pop up a menu for you with which you can navigate to different buffers or tabs or whatever but will also give you groups of commands so like space f will pull up everything that has to do with files so like searching files and searching for files and saving files and opening files and add space G, I think, or space V will bring you up like version control stuff, right? Yeah. So all different kinds of version control, cloning from version control, switching different version control branches, stuff like that. And this is all visually represented, whereas Vim doesn't visually represent almost anything. So that was really cool because that sounds a lot like what my text editor or what my browser does, excuse right. me, with my control space. It brings up, you know, talking about searching again, it brings up a interface where I can go through whatever I need to find it, right? Now, the unfortunate thing is it doesn't have a search engine to go through all these different options. 
Um, but it still does me one better when I'm talking about, you know, my biggest frustration here was I started forgetting everything, right? It helps me in the sense that I can now see everything visually in front of me. Uh, not only that, but it came with just a whole bunch of plugins that were available to enable. So I, of course, I turned the switch and switch a whole bunch of them on and then started playing around with the editor. Um, eventually, I backed off um, and re-enabled my, my Vim, but only after learning a lot of different tips and tricks from Space Vim, basically about what was what I was able to do with Vim, you know, what, what I was able to install, what I was able to configure, you know, and, and different ways of, of thinking about things, you know, which is uh, where I'm at right now. You know, I have a fuzzy grepper that can grep through an entire project of mine. Like I didn't even think about setting things up in, in project structures because Vim just doesn't have a native way to think about project structures. Right. So it takes about two or three different setups to, to, to get to a point where, okay, Every time I search, I'm searching only within up to my Git directory, right? In my in my Git working directory, um, a start page, Startify, did not know that was a thing, right? But I can put custom commands in there, so like every time I start up Vim, it'll drop me to the front page if I'm not specifically opening a file, and uh, I yeah. have one of uh, a shortcut there. I can up. Great, all my plugins because I hadn't done that in forever. So I can, totally. can hit you and that can, because I don't want to remember how to plug and install plus Q wall, you know, in order to, to upgrade all to my plugins. It, to upgrade it, yeah. I want that to be in my main menu for Vim. I want that to be just available right there for me. So this, this was simultaneously a way for me to remember everything that I'd forgotten and rediscover that that coolness right that that oh what can i do here right um and it made me because because there were a lot of paper cuts there that i didn't like like the way it dealt with buffers right i like the way mini buff explorer does it and i don't like the way it this does it right um this didn't have ranger in it instead it had yeah. some other file explorer and i'm like i just i don't like that so i'm gonna do my own thing so what I decided, I, I went back to, I have here, my last bullet point is Natty. <laughs> I went back to a, um, a Natty Vim and, you know, I'm, I'm going through my Vim RC right now, adding different plugins, different, you know, things and, and, and cleaning up more so than anything, uh, a lot of what I'm doing. And, and I'm spending a lot of time, like right now, I'm going through my Git configuration and saying, you know, what, how can I make Git easier for me? You know, I, do I need a visual representation? Do I need a menu? Do I need a preview of the status? Like, what what is going to help me using Git? And so I am I'm looking through that right now. Um, so what I wanted to do is go through editor features, you know, past, present, and future, and yeah. say, you know, what do you see is important in an editor? So like, you know, one of the things that I see as important is being, well, I don't, I don't know how to approach this, but you, you, you know, I've been, I've been talking for a while. So let's, let's say I have this list out here. I threw, okay. I threw yeah. a large list out here, right? I'm looking at it what right do, now. Yeah. What do you, what do you think, you know, what, what do you want to, what do you want to highlight? What, what do you see as uh, similar or different or do you have to add or that you take away or what? Yeah. The ones I really like, there are a handful that stick out to me here. Um, now I see one and I just want to make a note of it immediately because it's not something I jumped to, which is a uh, uh, compilation and syntax checking uh i think of linters that's one that i could immediately cross off the list for uh, that's uh, an editor does not in my eyes do that a text editor i'm kind of under the unix mindset something does it one job and it does its job well right i have a terminal open on the side for compiling and linting i don't put that in my text editor and that's kind of why i tend to stay away from uh the one it's the out of the box Python IDE, which I immediately think of. Um, I don't like that. Uh, I I like working in files, um, but just 
so there's one I hate. <laughs> but the ones I like here, uh, I like being able to see multiple files. I do like syntax highlighting. I like bracket matching. Uh, not autocomplete. You know, for HTML stuff, I do like. Um, sometimes it gets annoying with uh, defining methods um, in Python or Ruby because uh, it will just auto match uh, a, a method that I didn't want to call. And so I haven't been bitten before, but it is kind of annoying to have to, you know, it'll auto complete and then I have to, no, I don't want it. That's not what I want. Um, I do love my plugins, so I'm going to have to put plugin management up there. And then the rest, I would honestly say, aren't as important to me. So it's really kind of those four. Um, I, and the only reason I exclude Git integration is because that's another thing I do actually more or less from the command line. I do that from my terminal. I don't do that from my text editor. So I'm going to jump right in there. Uh, one of the cool things that SpaceFim implemented that I hadn't even thought of before was in the Vim gutter, which is like where the numbers yeah. are to the left-hand side of, yeah. of every yeah. file. It implemented a auto-hid, auto-hidden uh, gutter uh, column that showed on a git diff what the lines would look like, whether it's been added, removed, or changed. Gotcha. That is pretty nice. Yeah, that is. I will admit that is pretty nice. I do use that in Visual Studio, which is why I wanted to have this conversation because I know you you have those. Um, another thing with integration that I found is that uh, there's a command that will do will pop up a commit message for me. Yeah, yeah, and and I can look look through that, but it it pops it up in a new pane in my editor. Right. Not only that. But if you think about your commit messages, right, it, it shows you the list of files, whether that's yeah. tracked, untracked, modified, deleted, whatever. Vim has a go-to functionality, so a GF, which will go to that file. So if I don't recognize that file, um, I can do a GF and I can hop over there. Jump and over then, to it. using the previously explained Git integration, it will show me what lines have changed. Oh, that's sweet! Been yeah. added, modified, so I can I can do that right from within the session that I'm already in. Uh, so I think that's that's handy because I mean, honestly, I'm I'm either hopping somewhere else. I'm never not in my text editor when I'm doing Git commits, which really? is kind of my my litmus test here so i'm like is there a scenario where i'm not in my text editor running these commands um if there is a scenario where i'm not in my text editor then it's not a you know necessary thing that that should be in my text editor but if i'm always in my text editor tr uh, you know next to doing these commands you know then then absolutely this is something that's a candidate for for integrating into that yeah um so I, I think Git integration is is huge. Um, what do you think about uh, multiple files? I think that's almost a must. Yeah, yeah, it's it's absolutely a must. Um, but how it manages multiple files, I think, is right. is the question, right? So Vim obviously has splits, um, you know, which are keyboard controlled, and I've actually remapped some of those to make it easier to get around. Uh, the one thing I think I'd say that I really liked coming out of space Vim was its project management and really? being okay. able to, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there is, there's a plugin I've integrated. I forget what it is. I'll post the link to my Vim RC um, in the, in the show notes. So whoever can look around and, and see, see what I have in there, but there is a, there's a couple of plugins that work in conjunction with each other. There's Vim router which will search your present working directory, your PWD, to whatever your .git file is. So it'll look up your directory hierarchy and it'll CD. So like if I CD into my Camboard project, um, like if I open one of the files within there, it'll set my working directory to the root of that project, um, which is handy when I use the search functionality that I'll talk about later. But like um, I have... FCF and rip grep working so I can fuzzy search grep through all my files and 
doing that starts at the directory that I'm at. And obviously I don't want it to look through my entire root directory. I want it to look through the project that I'm currently in. Right. And I think that's, that's been at the forefront of what I've been thinking about. It was like, I want, I need, you know, I have different projects that I'm working on. I need my editor to be aware that I'm working on cam board right now, or I'm working on my Ansible role. I'm working on, you know, something else. Being able to define that has been kind of central as, as how I'm going around that. That and the search functionality, I think, is what I've been going for. So I think that's the thing that I should have put here, um, but I don't. But like the, the next thing I, I, I guess I'll touch on is um, using FCF, which I was talking about earlier. Yeah. I've actually paired it. It's it's really only the front end to FCF because I've actually paired it. The executable that it's calling is actually rip grep. So it's it's grep written in Rust, of course. And it searches through files incredibly fast. And it can find any line in a file. So I, I know what I've been doing a lot in Canboard is with the alarms. Yeah. And what I've been able to do with this is I've been able to look inside of my Canboard functionality by pulling up, popping up a, a menu right here and searching alarms. And it'll show me all the instances where the word alarm is in the code, like instantaneously. It's just a really, really fast search that searches the content of all of my directories there. Um, and I have you know a whole bunch of custom arguments to it. So it actually shows me that preview to the side of it. Um, but I... I was thinking, you know, what else could I use that search functionality for? Because that that is amazing to me that I can do that, which also goes hand in hand with my go to definitions. So I've remapped that even as well. Um, so there's there's the concept of indexing and, and tagging a code base and saying, uh, here are all the definitions in this project. Here's where we define this variable. Here's where that variable is defined. Here's where you know, this function is defined and being able to jump to that when you see that function in code is obviously immensely helpful. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so Vim builds that index by using an indexer. I think it's uh, exuberant C tags or universal C tags and then is able to go to that uh, using a command. Well, instead of that command, I remapped it to the hash key or the you know the pound sign because that pound sign usually just takes you up to the previous instance of that word i'm like that's not useful right i would rather it go exactly to where it's defined and and pop that up for me right so i've remapped that to take me to the definition when i'm over a variable or function name Um, so these these kind of it's right in front of me. I need I need to know where this is. Here's the thing, you know, whether the thing is a, a variable in front of me or whether the thing's in my head, I need to search for the alarms, right? Vim is getting me closer to within my project, find this and getting me that. I'd say which is needed. You're kind of SOL or stuck if you're you're, you're going to be spending a lot more time actually trying to find something. This is kind of what we touched on earlier. You're going to be stuck searching, you know, in a helper file for the actual method, you know, look digging through actual files. If you're not able to search immediately and jump to that definition. And that's where I was. That's exactly where I was. That does not sound fun. That doesn't, that sounds like you were just to- like toil right there. Cause you're not looking, you're not, you're seeing the methods call, but then you have to go spend more time looking for where, what it is and what's actually ha- happening behind the scenes. And then actually f- following line by line and what you're supposed to be doing. So which is why I didn't find having a file browser, uh, you know, helpful because it, it, it's not right. I know I have all the f- nerd tree and like uh, is the one I jumped to, and I think Ranger is that another one. Yeah, and and Ranger I do have. I I do have a keystroke so I can get there in in the event that I know exactly what file I'm going to. It's just super easy for me to navigate. But I don't need nerd tree persistently up there taking up space because I know what files I have open and which ones that I'm currently working on. And I know that because the functions are in them. That's the only reason I care about the files is that the functions are in them. Right. So I can, I can do just fine without having a visual representation of a file structure next to me. 
Yeah, with I was actually looking here. I have my Vim RC pulled up, and really, I just have some quick. It's a quick note uh, on what it is. It's uh, I don't know if you have yours up or anything, but it's what I have. Kind of major configurations are line and relative line. And this is kind of deep in the weeds at this point for my Vim configuration. This isn't this isn't anything of for the editor features, but this is you know line relative line. Tabs are four spaces. Uh, opening brackets, auto close, generate and auto close uh, bracket. Same with parentheses. I have nerd tree enabled. Uh, I have the theme enabled, and then you know parentheses are pretty is what I put in there. So it's actually very simple, very quick, very easy. I think it's only about forty five lines, maybe less, um, but it works for me, right? And that's kind of what it boils down to, but really well, I'm in the it, visual studio camp at this point in time. So, and to your point, I mean, there are things that I use, uh, my, my terminal for right now, the thought is if I were to place, replace this with visual studio, it would have to replace everything else I use Tmux for, because there's no way I'm flipping between two windows page to yeah both write code and run code and and do other things in code right? sure sure so like i have different uh terminal windows open to ssh to servers right i have different terminal windows open to manage docker um i have different terminal windows open to uh run the webpacker uh, yeah. dev script right and and the the ruby server right so those are open in tmux the, they're usually minimized because they're kind of running in the background but if i need to i can hop down and, and look into them but you know is that something i need to include in vim not necessarily right but if i were to replace that with vs code like i would i would need that to be part of it and the thought is i would rather something be automated because if I can't remember it, at least it could be automated, right? right? Because I'm, I, I know having gone through it before, I'm not going to remember all the shortcuts for all the languages in all of my setups in all of my Vim stuff, right? I'm just not going to remember it. I'm going to remember the things I do all the time, like the git commands and um, looking up files and, and searching around and stuff like that. I'm, I'm going to understand that, right? But the, the things I use maybe twice or three times a quarter... I'm I'm going to forget those pretty quickly. So I'd rather it be automated for me. Like if I have to automatically or if I have to manually run a syntax checker, right? I want yeah. that. I want that automated. I want information around if something is going to break, if I'm, if I'm writing bad code, right? Um, I want definitions to pop up for me rather than me having to go to them, you know? So there's there's a lot of things, and I'm still working through this. I'm honestly still working through a lot of this, and I might end up going back to Space Vim because, despite its, you know, many short shortcomings, it's it's not half bad, and it's got yeah. a good community around it too. So, um, but I'm I'm still playing around with my options, and I, I'm just trying to see what do I need here. What realistically, what do I need here? The one the one question I wanted to ask you is. Has there been anything that jumped out to you using VS Code that you're like, this is a huge step up from Vim? The one thing I do really like, oddly enough, that I didn't even mention that you kind of touched on, uh, there's a plugin for Git integration that I didn't even think about until you said it. And uh, as much as I don't think it's a necessary part of the workflow workflow every actually every line is uh i have like a little i don't even know what i would call it it says every line has the uh author of the line when it was authored and kind of like a git blame right there and the commit message yep. with that so it says you know i'm looking at the show notes right now it says you know andrew cz two days ago and that says add show notes and correct vault warden service so as much as I don't use that Git integration, it's there. Uh, I also really like, uh, so that that was called Git Lens. Um, I do really like the file navigation that's there and the search. That's the one thing I could never really get working in Git, uh, and I just didn't commit, didn't you know, 
sit myself down and commit to writing the go-to methods. Um, but in VS code, it just felt not far and away, but easier and a lot. It was just there. Yeah. You're right. You open the project, the whole project opens. And if you want to find the definition, it's very simple. It's, it's just, it was just there. So kind of came out of the box ready uh, with search, but uh, I did like that nav the file navigation that it offers. Um, then I could go into plugins for you know Ruby, Rails, React, but those are just plugins. Well, yeah, and I mean there's there's a lot out there, right? And and there's a lot out there in the community, and I'm excited to step out there and you know see. And this is this is just Vim. I mean this is the text editor that's been around there forever. There's there's so much stuff out there for everything that we offer. For Canboard, for Vault Warden, which we went over today, right? There's, there's a lot of things, and there's there's a lot of things that we need to to march further on with. Like, I mean, that's that's why NeoVim came came to the forefront to to push Vim to integrate plugin management and new language support and and different things. And and you know, if you believe like we do in the open source community and and the way that it drives innovation forward, you know. Um, and, and, and to jumpstart that, that innovation and, and, and really that, that evolution towards being able to, to do more with less, to, to, to be productive, right? Um, you know, we're, we're going to be here talking about that. If you want to share in that journey, right, go to rcompose.com and, and at least sign up for the newsletter, right? You, you'll be notified of as we put these things out, right? As we continue to talk about these, as we bring these things to the forefront, Right. We're going to we're going to make sure that these things are known, that these things don't get buried. Right. And we're going to keep on talking about them so that we can keep driving all these things forward. And with that, we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Composecast. Thank you. Be safe. And we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.